Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. All right, good afternoon, Team Crewlex community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brute Crewlex Center for Innovation and Creativity. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Crewlex Center, welcome back to the Broodcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Crewlex Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We'll also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who can't join us live today. So we ask that for the audience members, please be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as keeping your webcams off to help us uh, stream smoothly with each presenter. At the conclusion of all the presentations, we will have a chance to ask questions of the panel. So if you have a question as the panelists are going in their presentations, just go ahead and type it into the group chat. Our, our usual SOP is that I'll try and ask, uh, have you ask your question verbally in the order I get them so that you have a chance to engage with the panelists. If your equipment precludes you from being able to ask your question directly, just please annotate that in the chat and I'll ask the question for you and make sure you're credited for it. Okay, so with that, I'm pleased to th turn things over to our panel moderator, Dr. Leslie Wilhelm from the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy Research, Development, Test, and Evaluation. Dr. Wilhelm, over to you. Appreciate it, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, all, and thank you for joining us for a very exciting panel discussion. This is the second event in our series on restoring the strategic initiative in the South China Sea and a continuation of Colonel Corbett's talk from two weeks ago on the military innovator's dilemma. As our adversaries remind us through the Belt and Road Initiative, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, and Disinformation Narratives, innovation is not synonymous with technology development, and we must not become so fascinated by the technical access so as to lose sight on what it is that we really hope to accomplish. History has shown us that the satisfaction of tactical victories are quickly made moot through strategic loss. Deterrence is what winning truly looks like, however unsatisfying it may seem. Our adversaries have taken the levers of power and pulled us deep into a gray zone of their creation. We cannot delude ourselves that the military lover alone will be able to dig us out. While many of you may question how, with deeply entrenched stovepipes, we can work across diplomatic, information, military, and economic movers. However, it is only when we... When more of us look at the situation through the lens of grand strategy that we can begin to see what can and should be done. That said, please take full advantage of the opportunity to ask our esteemed panelists about their perspectives on using all of the various tools at our disposal to restoring the strategic initiative for us as well as our allies and partners in the region. Please let me welcome Mr. Drake Long, who will lead off our discussion today. Thank you, Drake. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the Krulak Center for inviting me to this panel. I was actually reading the history of it in the uh, latest issue of the Marine Corps University Journal. And I just got to say, you know, I think it's a great center. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a very timely kind of center for the kind of challenges that uh, the U.S. is facing and the Marine Corps is facing. And I think one of those premier challenges is the South China Sea, actually. Um, so I decided that I would tee up things a little bit for the rest of the panelists and just give everybody kind of a breath of what we've seen um, over the past year in the South China Sea. For those of you who don't know me, I was the South China Sea correspondent for Radio Free Asia for the past 10 months, um, and there was a lot going on in that time period. Uh, let me preface this by saying that what I say is my personal opinion does not reflect the opinion of my current employer or any past employer, Radio Free Asia, nobody. Broadly speaking, when I talk about the South China Sea, I think it's good to talk about some of the aspects of it. Uh, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, it is a semi-enclosed sea. It stretches from all the way of the southern tip of Taiwan, all the way down to the north of Natuna, near Indonesia. Roughly 1.4 million square miles of water. Not a lot of land in that water, but that's generally what we're fighting over. Over 3 million people in coastal communities depend on access to the South China Sea for their livelihood. And I can assure you that's definitely on the lower end of estimates. There's around 17 million tons of fish that land in South China Sea ports annually. That's worth about $22 billion. Um, and it's estimated as of 2016, which is a little bit dated, that 3.4 trillion in world trade passes to the South China Sea annually. 
So there is a serious economic um, stake here when it comes to the South China Sea. What we've seen over the period of 2019 and 2020 is a range of actors that are not directly connected to the South China Sea, Australia, India, the European Union, all start speaking a bit more stridently about what they perceive as their interests there. And they do have an interest there. It's in the trade and it's in the economic livelihood of those coastal areas and in the fish stocks especially. Um, at the bottom, a little fun fact, among all claims to the South China Sea, China and Vietnam are the only net seafood exporters. Um, and China dwarfs Vietnam by quite a bit, actually. So when we look at things like fish poaching in the South China Sea, which is something some of you guys might be aware of, it's really not to anybody's benefit um, but China's sort of a, a rights assertion because all the other claimants are mostly extracting fish for livelihood reasons. A lot of coastal communities rely on that uh, for selling, for eating in some circumstances. But for China, with its distant waters fishing fleet, it's just not the same. Okay, so I think the real story of 2020 is this phrase right here, jurisdictional waters, if you can see it. Um, we have seen this phrase employed by China in a range of circumstances, and most recently in its national Coast Guard law. And I think that it's really the story that China's been kind of setting up this entire time. Uh, jurisdictional waters, for those of you who don't know, it's a very vague term. It doesn't actually have any basis in international law or like a set definition. And China is extremely vague about what it means by having jurisdictional waters. Uh, and it's more or less implied that the entirety of the South China Sea within its nine dash line, its maritime boundaries are considered under its jurisdiction. There have been some Chinese Supreme Court cases that have said to that effect, just never so explicitly. But over this past year, we've seen certain events that I think give us a bit more clarity on what China considers by jurisdictional waters. So in April, we saw China name 55 undersea features and 25 land features in the South China Sea, basically giving them new historical Chinese names. Um, we mapped these out over at Radio Free Asia back when I worked there. And you can see just from a little graphic that we put up that a lot of these features are nothing. The above land features are sandbars. They are spits of sand. Uh, they have these very grandiose names, but they're essentially nothing of any sort of use. The undersea features are concerning uh, because China, by naming those undersea features, seems to be implying it has some sort of historical ownership to things on the seabed which is not permitted under international law and is, has been swatted down quite adroitly uh, by any international court that has kind of looked at it. In May, we had China's annual summer fishing ban go into effect, basically stating unilaterally that all fishing in the South China Sea down to a certain point has to end. That's not just for Chinese fishermen. That was also for Vietnamese and Filipino fishermen. China does this every single year. Um, the Filipinos and the Vietnamese pretty much always ignore it because they simply say, you know, you don't have jurisdiction to do that. But this year, China, even though there were many violations, we saw an instance of a Vietnamese fishing vessel getting rammed. We saw a Vietnamese fishing vessel get arrested. And we saw China announce a very sweeping law enforcement campaign to enforce the fishing ban that in the end may have amounted to a lot of rhetoric, but definitely seemed fairly threatening or at least uh, divisive at the time. In May 15th, the West Capella incident wrapped up, which was a very long uh, series of incidents between China and Malaysia, where Chinese Coast Guard ships were harassing Malaysian oil activity within, well, just barely within Malaysia's uh, exclusive economic zone. For those of you who don't know, China's Nine Dash Line extends very far down into Malaysian waters. And China has made a number of ways to assert its sort of sovereignty within Malaysian waters. And the West Capella incident, which I highly recommend everyone reads up on, uh, was definitely one circumstance like that. Uh, basically asserting oil and energy rights within Malaysian waters. And we've seen the same attitude taken towards the Vietnamese waters, Filipino waters, what have you. In June, there were these persistent rumors about a South China Sea air defense identification zone. China basically saying uh, we will announce an aid is over the South China Sea, similar to what we saw in the East China Sea back in, I want to say, 2013, 2014. An air defense identification zone is not the exact same thing as a no-fly zone whatsoever, um, but it's just it's another marker of sort of sovereignty. This ended up not amounting to anything, 
But it was apparently enough of a concern that on June 26th, the uh, ASEAN summit, uh, all the leaders gathered actually disputed the idea, or they disputed, they agreed to a statement saying that there should be freedom of overflight. And that might seem like a very minor thing, but it was probably the only thing that ASEAN could necessarily get consensus for on the time uh, that would implicitly, very vaguely, in the 10th, 15th, 19th degree, call out China's uh, threat of an aid is over the South China Sea. And then, of course, after that, China said, you know, we're not going to announce an aid is. That was never in our plan. It was not going to happen. Nothing ultimately came of it. And those rumors have sort of died down, although we're seeing a slight flare up in that since then. On July 1st, China kicked off a military exercise in the Paracel Islands. Um, again, basically saying if you're having a military exercise within those waters, you're claiming not only jurisdiction, but a pretty clear marker of sovereignty there. In the Paracels, China occupies every single spit of land there. So it's very difficult to sort of dispute that China has some sort of de facto sovereignty in that area. On July 13th, uh, we finally saw Vietnam cancel a contract with a oil rig that was in service with the Noble Corporation. That's been sort of a long running uh, pattern, actually, where Vietnam wants to explore oil off of its shore. China will come in and sort of harass oil rigs or harass survey ships or do whatever is necessary to intimidate those oil companies out of actually working in the area. And at this point, Vietnam's partners in the energy field have gotten quite uh, barren, quite low. I believe Repsol's pulled out. I don't believe the Russian oil companies are as keen as they used to be on Vietnamese oil contracts. Um, so it, it's, it's getting quite down to the wire where PetroViet, the Vietnamese state oil company, is the only one really operating in that space. But I'm sure the other speakers will cover that in much more detail. In August, late August specifically, we saw China's candidate win a seat at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, an international legal body. Uh, it does not actually necessarily dispute things with any sort of force, but for China, it's a great win in terms of legitimacy for its view on the South China Sea, sovereignty and international law in general. One thing to keep in mind is that while China's claims in the South China Sea are very unsupported under international law, China's not necessarily taking its toys home and saying, you know, well, screw you guys, we don't care about international law. China has been insisting this entire year, years in the past, that they care about international law. It's just everybody else is not getting it right, but China is. Um, so getting seats on ITLOS in these international bodies are about pushing China's version of international law so that it can accommodate China's sweeping, expansive South China Sea claims. And finally, in September 11th, we saw China announced a very strange, a strange public announcement of a drug bust off the coast of Fiery Cross Reef. Fiery Cross Reef is arguably China's main island in the Spratlys. It seems to be their main sort of base of operations, and they seem to be turning it into a commercialized city similar to what they've done with Woody Island up in the Paracels. But this drug bust was interesting because you had the Ministry of Public Security and not just the Chinese Coast Guard participate, explicitly saying, you know, we're, we're stopping these drug traffickers who were Chinese, to be clear, um, from entering the from um, trafficking drugs from, I believe it was the south of Cambodia up to the Chinese coast. But the language of the announcement stressed that this was within China's jurisdiction to do because it was within China's jurisdictional waters. And to me, that was very much a, a foretelling of what we saw later on. In November, we saw a National Coast Guard law get announced. And then in February 1st, it went into effect. So just three days ago. And in this National Coast Guard law, the final draft says explicitly uh, China is allowed to arm its Coast Guard ships and it's allowed to intake enforcement activities against other vessels within its jurisdictional waters. I believe that's under Article 3 of the law. And the final draft is actually vaguer than the first draft of the law that we saw. It, it, it goes very little detail about what jurisdictional waters implies. It just seems to say that anything that China calls jurisdictional waters, um, the National Coast Guard law, applies to, which means that Coast Guard ships can fire on other ships if they really have to. They can board other ships. They can interdict them. So we may be seeing uh, an expansive use of the phrase jurisdictional waters within the Chinese legal system to sort of apply to the entirety of the South China Sea. And I, I think that that's really something to be concerned about. But to me, 
this is the story of 2020. All of these various activities, undersea features, um, harassing oil companies that other countries are contracting with, exercises, an air defense identification zone, uh, putting Chinese candidates on international legal bodies are all to strengthen China's legal claim to the South China Sea. Within those expansive boundaries, have all of these incidents show what's called de facto jurisdiction. If they cannot get recognized legal jurisdiction over the South China Sea, they just have to get other countries to admit that they have some sort of jurisdiction outside of the realm of international law. If you harass Filipino fishermen and Vietnamese fishermen enough over a period of years, they're not going to fish in their traditional fishing grounds anymore. They will cede that area to Chinese fishermen, and they will cede that area during the summer fishing ban because they don't want to go up against law enforcement, especially if there's strengthened penalties like under the National Coast Guard law. Um, if you stop oil companies from exploring within Malaysian or Vietnamese waters, you are getting the Vietnam and Malaysia to tacitly admit that China has sovereignty or jurisdiction within their own exclusive economic zones. And then finally, if you do enough military exercises, if you fly enough military aircraft, you're going to get a lot of commercial shipping traffic and a lot of commercial air traffic to defer to your military when they're passing through the area. That is a tacit acknowledgement of your jurisdiction or your sovereignty over those waters. So in summation, I'm sorry I ran so long, but in summation, when we look at the phrase jurisdictional waters, which I think is the operative phrase of 2020, um, it applies to the waters of the South China Sea, but China also seems to think it gives them jurisdiction over the seabed of the South China Sea and the sky. The air is right above it. So you have all of these statements about freedom of overflight that are actually quite important because they're kind of challenging this three-dimensional definition of jurisdiction that China is trying to apply to the South China Sea, which, as we saw on the previous slide, it's, you know, it's over a million square miles of water that is as far from China's shore as anything. China does not necessarily have any right under international law to assert jurisdiction there. So uh, I hope I sort of teed things up for the uh, other speakers. At the bottom there, I have a short list of some diplomatic developments that I hope everybody glanced at, uh, but I believe that the other speakers will cover that in more detail. So that's my side of it, and I defer to the other three wonderful speakers. Um, that's, that's my piece. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks so much, Drake. That was phenomenal. Um, so that said, I will turn it over to Mr. Greg Pauling of the Center for Strategic International Studies to continue this story. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Leslie, and, and thank you to the, the Kerlock Center for hosting this event. Um, uh, it's always great to be part of such a, a wonderful panel. Usually I'd be seeing a lot of these folks uh, several times this year in the conference circuit, but I don't think any of us are leaving the rooms that you currently see us in. So this is the closest we can get. Uh, following up on Drake's presentation, I'd like to, to drill a little bit more into uh, where China has, has brought the situation in the South China Sea over the course of the last several years and particularly um, amid the, the COVID pandemic, and then look at what the current U.S. administration's options are and, and what the likelihood of any shifts are uh, now that we're two weeks into the Biden administration. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. I'm going to show a couple of, of brief maps and images. Uh, here we go. So as, as Drake uh, indicated the the real crux of the problem in, in the South China Sea, at least as far as the U.S. and the rest of the international community sees it, is the excessive nature of Chinese maritime claims. We have a whole separate set of disputes over island territories uh, that international law really doesn't have much to say about. The only U.S. interests tied up there are ensuring that the current status quo of occupation of the islands isn't changed by force, particularly because the Philippines, one of the occupants, is a U.S. treaty ally. And the last thing that anybody, Beijing, Manila, or Washington want is uh, the U.S. drawn into a, an armed conflict through the Mutual Defense Treaty because of an attempt to change the status quo of the island force. That still seems unlikely for, for the medium term. So the crux of U.S. interest rests with the maritime space, China's claims to water, to seabed, to airspace that are in direct contravention of decades of international law, international law that China helped write. As you see here, all of the Southeast Asian claimants make their maritime claims 
within the framework of the law. They claim fishing rights, oil and gas rights, territorial seas from their coastlines. And into that mix, you have China's ninth line, uh, where it claims historic rights, uh, as, as Drake pointed, increasingly termed in, in vague language like jurisdictional waters. This extends up to a thousand nautical miles from the coast of China. So you have had for years now an increasing day-to-day -day presence of Chinese fishing vessels, law enforcement vessels, militia vessels, oil and gas vessels, service ships, in a sense normalizing China's claims, despite the fact that everybody agrees that they're illegal. And what has really allowed this rapid shift of the step in China's favor has been two things. One is the modernization of China's naval coast guard force into now the largest navy and the largest coast guard in the world, in, in sheer number of ships, or in the case of the Navy, largest in the region. The other thing has been China's rapid creation of artificial island bases in the Spratly Islands, in the southern half of the South China Sea, which allows China to now project force, uh, well, to project, let's say, law enforcement and paramilitary force day in and day out in a way that would have been impossible for Beijing a few years ago. This is uh, one of China's facilities, Mr. Free. This is what Mr. Free looked like prior to uh, its island building campaign. And this is what Mr. Free looks like today. It's the largest of China's island bases, but not the only one. It's one of three air and naval bases in the Spratly Islands. It has a 3,000 meter airstrip. It has uh, full port facilities, buried fuel and ammunition storage, about 24 fighter jet hangars. Uh, missile shelters, and it's just brimming with radar and signal intelligence. To give you a sense of scale, most of Washington, D.C., inside of the 495 Beltway can fit inside the lagoon of Mr. Freeze there. And what that means in practice is that Beijing has now a unique capability to monitor all the waters and airspace of the South China Sea. It sees everything that moves on or above this disputed waterway. The U.S. cannot claim that, neither can any of the other claimants. China has a pretty substantial ability to project uh, to protect those features, uh, whether from the U.S. or from any other adversary. And most worryingly for the Southeast Asian claimants, China can now use those facilities, is using those facilities to forward deploy law enforcement vessels, uh, paramilitary vessels. It operates the largest fishing militia in the world, uh, and to maintain patrols off the coast of its neighbors. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This has become apparent since at least 2017 when most of that military infrastructure was completed, but it only ramped up last year, as, as Drake indicated. And one of the things that we we saw last year is that the number of ship days that the China Coast Guard spent in uh, various symbolically significant places in the South China Sea increased substantially. There was a China Coast Guard ship on patrol almost every day of the year at Luconia Shoals off the coast of Malaysia, at Second Thomas Shoal off the coast of the Philippines, where a Philippine Navy ship is permanently grounded and used as, as a de facto base, at Scarborough Shoal off the coast of Luzon, which China seized from uh, Philippine administration in 2012. And for the latter half of last year, there was a China Coast Guard ship at Vanguard Bank off the coast of Vietnam, where a lot of these oil and gas standoffs Drake referred to as happened. So if you are a Filipino or a Malaysian or a Vietnamese oil and gas operator, a Coast Guard ship or a fisherman, and you are going out more than a few miles from shore, you are pretty likely to bump into the China Coast Guard these days. That is a radical shift. It used to be, since these waters are 800 miles or so from the coast of China, that Chinese patrols were largely symbolic. They happened every once in a while, and then they had to sail back home. They no longer have to do that. One of the other things we noticed last year uh, at the height of the pandemic is that, that Chinese military signaling increased substantially, especially in the latter half of the year. This accounts of just public announcements by official Chinese media and Chinese ministries about missile tests, uh, ship visits, armed patrol activity, and, and exercises. And what you see is a real attempt by Beijing to uh, to present to the world that they it's de facto military control of these waters. So a whole lot of military signaling that continues to this day. I'm just going to wrap up with this. So we saw, as, as Drake said, uh, a number of violent incidents last year, mostly focused on oil and gas exploration. So uh, repeated harassment of 
uh, Malaysian drilling operation on at least two different occasions, one of which lasted for six months. Uh, the Haiyang DG8 uh, survey ship uh, was deployed both off the coast of Vietnam and off the coast of Malaysia to assert that these waters are in fact Chinese. And uh, you see increasing harassment of fishing activity by all the neighbors, increasing harassment of law enforcement activity. All of this combines to create a situation in which it is increasingly difficult for civilians of any stripe to operate in the South China Sea without China's permission. And that is the point. The point of uh, the island bases, the point of China's increasingly belligerent Coast Guard activity is to squeeze Southeast Asian claims out of their own waters and airspace and seabed in peacetime so that China can establish de facto control over these waters and the airspace and the seabed without ever having to fire a shot. Beijing has no intention of fighting a naval battle against a seven fleet for control of the South China Sea. China's intent is to leave so little space left for the Southeast Asians that they're just forced to take whatever deal is still on the table by that point. And in so doing, Beijing will do considerable damage to U.S. credibility as a regional security provider. Not only are all of these parties important partners for the U.S., but one of them, again, is a treaty ally. And the Philippines would not be wrong to wonder what good that treaty alliance is doing if the U.S. provides no protection against this harassment just below the level of military force, day in and day out. It also does considerable damage to the entire idea of freedom of the seas and freedom of navigation. And you would be hard-pressed to find a U.S. national security interest that has been more abiding than the idea of freedom of the seas. I mean, it's why Jefferson sent the Marines against the Barbary pirates. It's why we got into the War of 1812. The U.S. and China were both at the table hashing out these rules during the uncle negotiations of the 70s. Uh, and so we would not live in a world safer or more prosperous if we return to an idea that the, the oceans are the Wild West and whoever has the biggest guns gets to claim whatever they want. Now, the problem for the U.S. has always been that this is a slow-moving, rather pernicious crisis. China is very careful to keep things in the so-called gray zone level, below the level of military force, quite careful not to present a ally to the U.S. or anybody else. Uh, and the U.S. has had difficulty maintaining the level of attention and focus to this issue that it deserves, because there's always other crises, uh, you know, whether it's Russia and the Ukraine or the latest incidents with Iran or Syria or North Korea, always something else seems more critical, more important to the sea. And so as a result, we look back and suddenly realize that China is in almost complete control of these waters, uh, and nobody's really sure how uh, the international community let this happen. What can the new administration do about this? Well, it can build off the work of the last administration and the one before that both of whom attempted to strengthen U.S. deterrence, strengthen U.S. forward presence in the region in order to keep the Southeast Asians in their own waters, having the ability to, to maintain some access, uh, even though we all know that that's a losing race. That can only continue for so long. Eventually, China will establish de facto control of these waters. That is all meant to buy time for presumably a long-term diplomatic and economic strategy, and that is the part that's really never been clear. Um, the Obama administration tried, in cooperation with Japan and the Philippines, to establish a international coalition to impose costs and name and shame China, uh, to clarify its claims and abide by this court ruling uh, that, that the Philippines won in 2016. But that largely fell apart in 2016, mostly because of the changing government in Manila, not the one in Washington. The Trump administration particularly the last year, started upping the, uh, turning up the heat on the diplomatic front again. And it's had some success getting the Europeans to speak up, the Japanese, the Australians. Uh, what the Biden team really needs to do is now build on that by making this a major issue in every international forum it can. Trying to bring as many parties as it can to the table to name and shame Beijing in a way that makes clear that if China wants to be a global leader, a global rule setter, which Beijing clearly does, it can't also be a serial rule breaker in its own backyard. Uh, the U.S. also needs to explore economic costs. Chinese companies that engage in illegal activity, whether it's illegal oil and gas surveys or illegal militia activity or what have you in the South China Sea, should be treated the same way that Russian paramilitaries were treated in the eastern Ukraine, or that we treat North Korean uh, sanctions violations. They should be 
targeted for economic sanction, they should be publicly identified and named and shamed, et cetera. And in the meantime, as the U.S. and the international community kind of plays bad cop to try to incentivize China to reach for compromise with the Southeast Asians, uh, there needs to be a reinvestment in deterrence capability because that diplomatic and economic strategy is at best a 10-year strategy, and the Filipinos don't have 10 years. So what do you do in the next two, three, four years to keep China from just steamrolling the Southeast Asians? I would argue the most important thing is putting the U.S. Philippine alliance back on stable footing. It was helpful that the Secretary of State made his first call on South Asia to his Philippine counterpart to reiterate that the Mutual Defense Treaty applies in the South Sea. Uh, it's problematic that there are no, no U.S. forces of any note closer than Okinawa or Guam, which is about 1,300 nautical miles from the Spratly Islands. And so it's unclear what exactly the U.S. would be using to respond to any Chinese attack on Filipino forces in the Spratlys. We need rotational access to Philippine bases. Uh, otherwise, that is a largely hollow commitment. And from the Marine Corps perspective, I mean, an awful lot of the evolving doctrine today focuses on dispersed Marine Corps fire teams in the first island chain which south of Japan can only mean the Philippines. Uh, you can draw all the range rings you want. Uh, a naval strike missile or a tomahawk can't hit the Spratly Islands from Okinawa or Guam. And so the number one goal of the U.S. as far as its counter a to ad strategy and deterring China has to be figuring out how you get back into the Philippines uh, in a way that can actually hold Chinese ships at risk in the Spratly Islands. And I will uh, wrap up my presentation there. Fantastic, Greg. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, so the next part of the story will be brought to you by uh, Dr. Thayer, who is uh, with us all the way from Canberra, Australia. So greatly appreciate it. And I will turn it over to you, Dr. Thayer. Thank you, Leslie. I'd like to thank you and the Kulak Center for this uh, opportunity to address you. In my long career, I've never addressed the Marine Corps University. So that's a first to me. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to do so. I want to provide a, a huge overview uh, going back 26 years. The quest, the holy grail of peace and security in the South China Sea, as it's sometimes called, was initiated in 1995 by the Philippines after China occupied Mischief Reef, a feature in Philippine waters, and established huts for fishermen. It's, it's now got a three-kilometer air base on it. So from that moment onwards, the Philippines started advocating an ASEAN, a code of conduct. Little known was it took after five years the two sides exchanged codes of drafts of code of conduct, but they didn't get anywhere because they couldn't agree on the geographic scope. Uh, if restrictions should be placed on constructing anything on occupied and unoccupied features, uh, the shoe on the other foot back then was uh, objections to military activities in the waters adjacent to the Spratlys, and that was uh, uh, China concerned about U.S. activities. And whether or not fishermen who were found detained in disputed waters uh, could be uh, arrested. And so from that, it, another two years later, a political definition, a political agreement was reached rather than a proper code, which set out, and that's the basis now of all negotiations, that this must be fulfilled before you get a code, is setting out cooperation in five areas. And you can see here, and, and Except for hotlines and the queues, the code for unplanned encounters at sea, Western Pacific Naval Symposium, nothing much has been done. Marine environmental protection, marine scientific research, the, uh, the hotlines are under safety of navigation and communication at sea, search and rescue, and then combating transnational crime, including but not limited to the following areas. So those are the areas of cooperation that should have been carried out from 2002 to the present. But the Declaration of Conduct of Parties also set uh, on paper a goal of achieving a code of conduct on the basis of consensus, not majority vote. And so that's what's still being pursued to this very day. So in 2004, two years later, they got terms of reference to establish a ASEAN-China joint working group, and that is the key negotiating venue, and then it reports to senior officials. Uh, the first meeting of that joint working group, ASEAN tabled a draft guidelines, and uh, some 18 revisions took place over six years, and only one major change was made. In the first draft, 
ASEAN said they wanted to caucus and meet together as a group and then meet with China. Six years later, ASEAN gave away that position. And, there, and it's therefore 10 ASEAN countries individually negotiating with China to achieve consensus. And of course, that opens up um, activities for China to, to play on that. And then finally, in 2017, they agreed on an overall framework uh, to, to fill in the blanks to come up with a code. So that's the progress. Now, a key turning point in here, before I continue, uh, just just to delay it, we've heard it from, from Drake. Uh, there are, uh, and, and Greg, the nine dashed line, uh, are these dashed lines alone, are four um, island or four groupings that China calls Shahs, um, the, the Pratis, the Paracels, the Macclesfield Bank, and the Spratleys. I'm going to be referring them to them later. I just wanted to show them on the match. Key turning point was a deadline in May 2009 for countries wanting uh, to extend the limits of their continental shelves to make claims. And China then submitted this particular map, making its claim on historic grounds to 60 to 80 percent of the waters there. The claimants involved, Brunei, and on Greg's map, you could see they had a 200 nautical mile extension, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Taiwan, which occupies uh, two features to Abu or uh, Taiping Island. I put Indonesia in uh, italics because it's involved. We heard that from Drake about Natuna Islands. But Indonesia makes the claim, we are not a disputant. All our boundaries are right under international law, and we refuse to discuss it with anybody. So we're not a party to the dispute. 2018, the ASEAN countries and China reached formal agreement on a draft code of conduct for the South China Sea. I was leaked a copy, and I've written about it. And I'm, my presentation is based on that copy. Uh, what it was is a nine states, Laos and Myanmar didn't contribute, uh, just put it, submissions in and they were filed under the, the, the framework. So it's a, a massive compilation that needs editing. Uh, it has three parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the general provisions are the key. It's not an instrument to settle territorial disputes or maritime delimitation issues. And indeed, the major international law, UNCLOS, doesn't do that either. It's just to guide state behavior. It's supposed to go through three readings after each amendment. Only one has occurred. When it was adopted, China immediately set a, on its own unilaterally a three-year time frame, which would end now. But last year, not one face-to-face -face meeting or virtual meeting by the working group was held uh, to discuss because of the COVID virus. So there's a, a stall in that process. Generally, uh, and in great detail, uh, eight or nine international laws and conventions are appealed to and referred to, uh, to to get this code, the duty to cooperate under international law, practical maritime cooperation, and these provide segues, I think, for external powers to assist the ASEAN states, how to exercise self-restraint, build trust and confidence, how to prevent incidents, how to manage incidents, and then other undertakings. That's too detailed for me to cover in 12 minutes. So now uh, I now turn to the dime construct to put the where this uh, code of conduct is in. China insists that these disputes can only be settled bilaterally between China and the country concern, and that's why it resisted ASEAN's attempt to caucus first. And so you have China negotiating with 10 members, uh, third parties are excluded, and China can exploit that consensus principle, and it's used Cambodia to effect a one-year stalling any, any progress whatsoever. Second, you, and the diplomacy is, okay, China and bilaterally, and then you have within the 10 countries of ASEAN, not all of whom are claimants. Miramar isn't, for example. Uh, so the chair rotates annually, so you have a problem of continuity, and it just passed from Vietnam to Brunei. Uh, two annual ministers of foreign meetings and annual summits. Uh, and so what you do is get joint statements that are vague. They never, ASEAN has never, since its first statement in 1992, ever mentioned China by name. Uh, they talk about legal and diplomatic processes uh, rather than the arbitral tribunal ruling, et cetera. And then you have uh, the kind of negotiations between ASEAN and its dialogue partners, uh, China, the special summits, the United States, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Russia. 
Uh, generally, they're grouped in ASEAN-led mechanisms by the eight, so it's defense ministers plus are, are the group of eight. So you have a kaleidoscope of diplomatic efforts, but the main game is China versus uh, the 10 ASEAN countries themselves. Okay, information. To put the context to what the other speakers say, China has, has for decades now, pursued three warfares uh, in their guidelines. Public opinion warfare, and they tell everybody in the region the U.S. is the cause of all instability. The U.S. would just go home and cease interfering. Uh, there'd be peace cooperation, and we could all sing Kumbaya. Psychological warfare and legal warfare. And we've heard elements of legal warfare, particularly the law and Coast Guard, in the previous two speakers. The ASEAN claimants, in regard to this, merely go to a fallback position. They base it on international law, UNCLOS in particular. Major developments occurred in late 2019 and throughout 2020, where Malaysia put in a subsequent claim for an extended continental shelf, and that produced a cascade of diplomatic notes, note verbals, to a commission on limits of the continental shelf, uh, in which the ASEAN claimants individually, leaving Brunei out, uh, refused to accept the basis for China's claim of grouping the Shahs as a single unit by put, drawing baselines around them, etc. And then the uh, United States put in a very forceful, it changed its position from not taking sides to clarifying under international law what China could not occupy, specific features named by Greg, Second Thomas Shoal, Laconia, etc. And then the submission by Germany, France, and the UK joint uh, to the UN uh, Secretary General, not the Commission, because they're not uh, direct Australia uh, put one in. So there's a coalescence on the legal side uh, that could be used in the future. And as I said, ASEAN itself, when we're looking at information warfare, never mentions a country by name, uh, only expresses strong concern by some members uh, giving an out. So from information, we continue. Uh, the way China, and we've heard this of claiming the three dimensions, China claims it was the first to dis discover, name, occupy, and administer the features in the South China Sea. Yet when I challenge them at places like the Shangri-La Dialogue to give me an example where they have lost because they claim these features have been stolen from them, give me an example where it's happened, they can't do it. The historic right to nine dash lines that was rejected by the tribunal has given way to the four shahs that I've already mentioned. The attempt to group dispersed geographic features in the, in the South China Sea in baselines. All waters inside are territorial, draw lines from the baselines outward to claim maritime zones. The Pratis, Macafil, Paracels, and Spratleys. And China totally rejects the arbitral tribunal um, award 2016. And when the three European countries put their note verbal in, China shot back that the UN Convention on Law of the Sea isn't the be-all and end-all of international law. So totally rejecting it or trying to, through lawfare, the, the, the counter-legal arguments of these states. Now, I know we do have a Biden administration, but the last American policy uh, on this uh, was by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and where they've identified the offshore, uh, the, the features that the U.S. says that China cannot claim, and a key argument may, being made is that the fisheries and other resources in the billions of dollars is being denied the countries of Southeast Asia for their own development by China's actions. And then uh, the attempt to form an alliance of democracies, which is the theme Biden has picked up, but I think with a different twist, because I think the, the rhetoric of Secretary Pompeo was what I would call an anti-communist party of China crusade, uh, 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 had an element of uh, regime change. So we have to fill in the blanks with the new Biden administration as to how much continuity, and I think on the legal side, there will be that. So on the military side, we've had the militarization of the islands, the forward operation bases that um, Greg has described, but I'd make it into... Three, three categories here. There's an action-reaction cycle between all, all these Chinese military activities and what the U.S. does, deploying carrier uh, strike groups, uh, carrier task for, uh, strike forces, and combining them, having constant naval presence in addition to freedom of navigation. 
an old bomber program has been slightly modified by replacing B-52s, although some were just deployed to Guam, to overfly the South China Sea last year, engaging in air-sea uh, combined exercises. Uh, so that's that's occurring, and that's part of the military struggle, but it isn't going to change, I think, the trend, so I agree with Greg on that. Uh, the mention of gray zone tactics, the constant use of paramilitary, maritime law enforcement, and fishermen to advance Chinese interests, harassment, intimidation, using fishing fleets to, to surround the whole uh, Pagasa, Titu Island of the Philippines to prevent Philippine fishermen from accessing the fisher grounds, maritime militia, the little blue men, the fishermen that can walk in the cabin and come out in uniform and sidearms, uh, challenging the U.S., uh, which either it's gray hull American warships or what else, the U.S. Coast Guard likely could figure in the future within that new tri-service strategy uh, announced late last year. And finally, the claimant states just use law enforcement vessels, or in the case of Malaysia uh, last year over Laconia, uh, de deploying uh, some of their frigates to, to monitor the situation. So that's there, and uh, I'd like to... Uh, also point out that in the draft code of conduct, there's a whole detailed proposal by China for military cooperation exercises, wonderful, except they want to exclude any country from outside the region. And so they have a, a, a proposed clause that has to be accepted that no party hold joint military exercises from outside the region unless countries give advance notice and no country expects uh, expresses an objection. Finally, economic. China is the largest trading partner with each of the individual states, and that gives them tremendous leverage in addition to the poaching and, and the use of marine resources. China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, provides funding for infrastructure, another access of leverage. COVID-19 assistance to these countries uh, for PPE and vaccines and Chinese defense and, and foreign ministers have visited the, the region continually in the last several years. Opposed to that, the Quad, which although it's moving into naval exercises, has a financial component where the four countries concerned, U.S., Japan, India, and Australia, want to provide high funding for high-quality infrastructure. Uh, so it's another way of, of pulling back against the, the Chinese influence. But here again, in this draft code of conduct, very detailed cooperation on all the marine resources between China and the countries of Southeast Asia, but oil and gas exploration should not be conducted in cooperation with countries from outside the region. Malaysia's proposal said we're a sovereign state, we'll do it with whomever we like. So finally, the key issues, and this is for a broad U.S. strategy is to help influence uh, the end state of getting a code of conduct, but here are the, here's what's up. The code does not define the geographic area, scope of that, that's to be South China Sea where, or where areas are disputed. That needs to be clarified. Uh, that they mention uh, maritime law enforcement, but they also say that appended to this draft could be cooperation uh, guidelines and protocols. And that's why I say external countries, Australia, United States, and their military forces that have experience in this could contribute uh, bilaterally or even multilaterally. Uh, the question of military exercises and demilitarization needs to be what restrictions should be put on them and what weaponry does China have on those artificial islands uh, that might be seen as ups upsetting regional stability. There is no dispute settlement mechanism in here. It's all voluntary at the moment. So uh, like the, the DOC in 2002 may not have a solution. There's no role of third parties excluded by China's uh, aspects but not included in these discussions and the law and the counter diplomacy is that the u.s and other countries have been saying that the interests of third parties should not be undermined by that code and finally the legal status of the code of conduct should it become treaty law and therefore approved by national parliaments and legislatures and deposited with the u.n and china is resisting that so with that i end thank you very much thank you so much dr thayer definitively appreciate it um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Big Tran, who will round off our panel discussion uh, prior to questions, uh, to talk about relationships for Vietnam and the South China Sea, which have become a, a major issue of late. Thank you. Yeah, um, 
First, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Leslie Wilhelm for putting uh, this panel together and uh, to uh, Mayor, Ian, uh, Major Ian Brown for being a wonderful host. Um, so, and also many thanks to other speakers for providing a lot of um, extra information that I don't need to repeat. Okay. So, I will briefly discuss how Vietnam is strategic partnership and their variance uh, to advance its interest in the South China Sea. The analysis will divided into Vietnam's partnership with China on the one hand and with Russia, Japan, India, and the United States as counterweight to China on the other. It was so spread across three different years from 2001 to 2008, uh, from 2009 to 2013, and from 2014 to present. The last part will discuss some implications for the United States to uh, compete with China strategically. So, in the post Cold War era, uh, strategic partnerships and uh, their variants have emerged as an alternative to alliances and uh, regional institutions for managing economic and security cooperation. Their main purpose is to address common challenges and see joint opportunities rather than countering a specific country or group. These partnerships are flexible, uh, non binding, and multidimensional in nature. Therefore, participating countries can gain benefits such as economic and security assistance without the risk of entrapment or loss of autonomy. These features make strategic partnerships and the like more attractive than uh, alliances, and as a result, they have flourished in the recent years. Uh, the participating countries use various terms to describe their partnerships with uh, others. Vietnam, for example, designates at least five titles to its partners, as you can see in the graph. Without providing any official de uh, de uh, uh, definition, the Vietnamese government has articulated that a comprehensive partnership uh, is generally a lower level than a strategic partnership, although it does not apply to all cases. Uh, it's very confused to compare across different partnerships, but within uh, a particular one, uh, the hierarchy holds true. Uh, the, the parties usually start with a comprehensive or uh, with a strategic partnership and then elevate it to a higher level. Those partnerships cover many areas uh, of cooperation, including economic, um, security, and defense, but they are first and foremost uh, diplomatic agreements. Uh, besides existing treaty uh, alliances, um, they can back the goal. The United States uh, has formed strategic and comprehensive partnerships with several South Asian countries, including uh, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And as for Vietnam, it has actively built partnerships with countries uh, both inside and from outside the region. And by 2020, Vietnam has established 17 strategic partnerships, including the elevated form and 13 uh, Comprehensive partnerships. I will focus on Vietnam's partnership with the five countries mentioned earlier. So, in 2001, Vietnam signed a strategic partnership with Russia and has used it to modernize its military. The 2001 joint statement says that the military supplies were not to oppose any third country. True or not, Vietnam's military expenditure has increased almost seven times since 2003, and Russia has been Vietnam's biggest uh, arms supplier. Vietnam also signed a strategic partnership with Japan uh, in 2006 and with India in 2007. However, none of the joint statements uh, mentioned South China Sea. The first time Vietnam mentioned the South China Sea in such documents was in a joint statement to establish a comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership with China in 2008. In the document, there are a lot of honey-coated words and phrases, such as 
good neighbor, good friends, good comrades, and good partners, mutual trust and mutually beneficial cooperation. Uh, moreover, the, the two sides agreed to strictly act on the relevant agreement which between the two countries' top leaders uh, jointly maintain stability in the South China Sea, maintain the negotiation mechanism for maritime issues, and remain committed to seeking a basic, long-term, and mutually accept acceptable solution through peaceful negotiation. However, the reality is that China has conducted large scale recommendation and militarization of many disputed features. Uh, repeatedly intruded into Vietnam's sovereign waters and systematically interfered with oil and gas development by Vietnam and other countries in the region. Vietnam soon realized that it could not count on China to keep it work. After China submitted a map to the United Nations showing the so-called Nine Dash Line in 2009, Vietnam has frequently raised the South China Sea dispute in joint statements with its partners, including non claimants And after the 2014 oil incident, uh, when Beijing deployed a state-owned oil into Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, Vietnam has deepened defense ties with Japan, India, and the United States. In the 2020 joint statement to upgrade the Russian-Vietnam strategic partnership, to a comprehensive strategic partnership, the two countries believe that the territory, territorial disputes should be resolved only by peaceful means, without the use of force or the threat of force, or on the basis of existing international law, especially the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The two sides support the full implementation of the 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea and um, the need to develop a code of conduct. In 2013, Vietnam signed a comprehensive uh, partnership with the United States. The two sides adopted the same exact point using uh, a slightly different language. And in 2013, and in 2014, Vietnam and Japan elevated their ties to an extensive strategic partnership. The joint statement underscored that any unilateral and coercive action to challenge peace and stability should not be overlooked. Uh, it emphasized the importance of freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea and called upon relevant parties to practice self restraint besides not the point in previous statements. Japan saw the urgent need to improve the capacity of Vietnam's maritime law enforcement agencies and offered Vietnam six second-hand boats in 2015 and six brand new ones in 2017. In 2020, Vietnam agreed to buy six Coast uh, Guard partial boats worth about 3045 million US dollars from Japan. Vietnam also upgraded its relationship with Russia and India to a comprehensive strategic partnership the same level with Russia in 2016. The highlight of the joint statement between Vietnam and India uh, is the mention of the award issued on July 12, 2016 of the arbitral tribunal that ruled China's night dash light invalid. And their acknowledgement of the award is significant because many countries, you know, under pressure from China, did not voice their support for the ruling. India has helped Vietnam enhance its maritime capability with uh, $600 million line of credit uh, and training for Vietnamese Navy to operate Russian mixed submarines. In 2017, Vietnam and the United States agreed to extend their comprehensive partnership. Uh, the 2017 joint statement called upon all parties concerned to implement their international legal obligations in good faith. Um, although the statement did not uh, call China by name, but it clearly implied that China should uh, uh, 
comply with the 2016 ruling. And furthermore, uh, Vietnam and the United States highlighted the importance that parties refrain from actions that would escalate tensions, such as militarization of disputed teachers, again implied in China. The United States said that it would continue to fly, sail, and operate anywhere that international law allows. Uh, since 2017, the United States has helped Vietnam improve its maritime capability with uh, at least 18 pressure boats and a Coast Guard cutter. Uh, the two countries are expected to upgrade their relationship to a strategic partnership in the near future. Um, although the U.S. Um, government official said that there is no difference between the two terms, uh, a formal agreement will provide a better framework for digital cooperation. Um, and among Vietnam's major partners, the United States is the most powerful and the most vocal in criticizing China, and therefore the most important factor in helping Vietnam protect its interests in the South China Sea. Then why did Vietnam, you know, only have a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive partnership, the lowest level among its partnerships with the United States? And given China provocative actions that directly threaten its interest in the South China Sea, why did Vietnam dedicate the highest level of cooperation to China? The answer is twofold. First, China plays an uh, extremely important role in Vietnam's economic development and regime survival. Uh, and second, there is still a lot of, you know, lack of trust between Vietnam and the United States. Can we see U.S. support for pro-democracy dissidents and promotion of higher human rights standards as aiming at overthrowing the Vietnamese Communist Party? Although several U.S. you know official documents named Vietnam as a growing economic and security partner, the Trump administration's America First Prime Policy sent very confusing signals about U.S. intentions. And during the negotiation for the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP, the United States put a lot of pressure on Vietnam to comply with TPP's labor obligations which Vietnam tried very hard to follow. However, the Trump administration's decision to walk away from the deal created doubt in Vietnam on whether the United States can be a trustworthy partner. So by understanding these issues, we can find ways to improve the U.S. relationships, not just with Vietnam, but with other allies and partners. The first thing is to be trust Although the United States, you know, should continue to put pressure on China's human rights, it should uh, distinguish between Beijing as a revisionist state and Beijing as a communist regime. So the expensive trade in the South China Sea and the uh, predatory economic practice are sides of a revisionist. Um, these distinctions will help with U.S. relations with Vietnam. Um, moreover, the United States should be more consistent in its foreign policy. You know, not just saying uh, allies and partners are important, but then always put uh, America above others. Uh, second, the United States should restore its uh, credibility by upholding international agreements and taking back its leadership. Um, and you know, as China has repeatedly used economic coercion to punish other countries that challenge its territorial trends and foreign, uh, foreign policy ambitions. Um, in my opinion, the best way for the United States to compete with China uh, strategically is to reduce Beijing's economic power by helping U.S. allies and partners to lessen their economic dependence on the Chinese market. Um, on that front, the Trump administration squandered a great opportunity when it withdrew from the TPP. Uh, should the Biden administration wish to rejoin the TPP, now called CPTPP, there should be ways, you know, to make sure that the next U.S. government will respect the group 
and cannot just walk away so easily. And in addition, you know, mechanisms such as the economic prosperity network, ending up reducing uh, dependence on Chinese supply chains should be continued. So with that, I will end here and thank you for your attention. Greatly appreciate it, thank you. Um, I am going to go ahead and turn the, uh, the forum back over to Major Brown to go ahead and facilitate questions. So thank you to you all. Greatly appreciate excellent discussion and looking forward to some, uh, some equally great questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wilhelm. Uh, for those who've already put your questions in the chat, thank you. I'll start going through those. And for anyone who uh, would still like to ask a question, just go ahead and throw it in the chat and we'll uh, try and get to as many as we can. So. Uh, first question, uh, the questioner can't ask it himself, so I will, but this is from Mr. Eric Harris asking, um, other than the maritime operations, what other military methods may China use to further their claims? Is there any chance of China supporting or compromising local anti-government armed groups to attempt to disrupt, destabilize uh, local governments? I would say virtually nil. I mean, all the governments in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, work with China and are dependent on China. So except for involvement in Myanmar before the coup with minor groups along the border, which is not trying to overthrow the NLD, National League for Democracy government, China has no interest uh, in overthrowing or supporting any group uh, within Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, or Laos, in, in my opinion. So I was just, uh, I would just leave it there. It uses economic uh, leverage. It floods uh, certain countries like Cambodia with, with its uh, enterprises, and they run their own little fiefs and, and have areas of influence. That's easier to do uh, than it is to try to. And besides, which the government in Cambodia isn't anti-China. So, and even Vietnam is not taking an anti-China position. It wants an investment in its country. Okay, thank you. Uh, any of the other panelists want to add thoughts to that? I'll, I'll uh, jump in. I mean, I agree with Carl that the the days of the PRC supporting you know communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia ended in the 70s. Um, the aside from kind of the gray zone tactics we've talked about and the possibility of actual kinetic action, the biggest threat from China for Southeast Asian parties is cyber. Um, You've already seen, with every increase in tension in the South China Sea, increases in state-supported cyber attacks against Vietnam, against the Philippines. Uh, every time the Philippines has conducted a military um, activity of any scale in the South China Sea, for instance, when they had to resupply their Marines on the Sierra Madre, the ship that they've got grounded on Second Thomas Hill in 2014, the Chinese knew about it because they've penetrated every uh, part of, of the Philippine defense establishment's computer networks. Now you've got concerns about Chinese uh, state-linked telecom companies building cell towers on Philippine military bases that uh, is deeply problematic. And there's a reason that Vietnam is the only country in Southeast Asia that has explicitly banned Huawei from its critical 5G infrastructure because they understand the threat from Chinese cyber intrusion. From Mr. Gary Lehman, and this is getting looking for your insights collectively into sustaining and disruptive innovations for the South China Sea. So first part of the question is, what can we on the U.S. side, you know, not just the DOD side, but you know, the different elements of national power, uh, can we do better in sustaining innovation? And then two, what are some new or different things that we could do to make China react to our activities rather than us reacting to theirs? All right, Mr. Long, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, so this is a, a pretty big question, but there's a couple things I think I can harp on here. Um, so what can we do better? Reducing economic dependence on China is, I think, the big thing that a lot of Southeast Asian countries actually kind of want, the, not just the U.S., but other countries to kind of help out with. Um, we're now coming off a period where the Philippines went very hard into an economic relationship with China for some pretty dubious reasons and is now reaping very little rewards from it in terms of infrastructure investments and actual construction. Um, the hollowness of some of China's economic deals in the region are starting to kind of come to light. And there's a, a real chance to sort of step in 
and say, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to China for infrastructure investments or they don't have to be the only economic game in town. Um, the U.S. or more likely to be perfectly clear, a coalition of economically powerful countries like in the TPP can sort of step in. On the infrastructure front, what we can do better is there was a very good idea laid out a couple of years ago about pairing the U.S., the new, I believe it's called the International Development Finance Corporation. Okay. Uh, pair that with Japanese and potentially South Korean infrastructure companies to provide that alternative to Southeast Asian countries and elsewhere in terms of they don't have to get a bridge from China or a high-speed rail from China. They can get it from Japan with U.S. backing and a little bit of U.S. support. And I think that's something that we should do better, as in, like, invest in that as maybe a cornerstone of U.S.-Southeast Asia policy, in my opinion. Because if you look at countries like Indonesia, there is a massive appetite for infrastructure. Uh, there's a, a quite a bit of skepticism about Chinese investment in those areas for good reason, but that's tempered by the fact that Chinese infrastructure is so cut rate. And, you know, when it works, you get it at a very good price. And in some cases, it's just simply the only game in town. The U.S. does not build infrastructure abroad anymore. We just don't. Um, so we have to partner with a country like Japan or South Korea or maybe even Taiwan to kind of provide that. But creating a sort of consortium to help wean countries off of economic dependence on China is probably a pretty good strategy um, going forward. What new different things can we do to make China react to us? Uh, I mean, I think this is probably not necessarily new. I think this is probably something that's been in the works for a while now. But an operational Coast Guard presence by the U.S. Uh, in Southeast Asia, or at least around the U.S. territories there, not there, but a little bit north, is probably a very good idea. Right now, China has an advantage in that they can send Coast Guard vessels and People's Armed Forces maritime militia ships into the South China Sea. And if the U.S. responds with its Navy, it's kind of like, are you really going to fire on a Coast Guard ship with your Navy ship? That's probably not going to happen. When we talk about gray zone warfare, that's sort of what China's good at right now, is that they can always go right to the threshold of armed conflict of the military, but not quite get over it. And the U.S. does not have a lot of tools, like physical tools in the South China Sea to respond to these incidents with the Chinese Coast Guard when they happen. So, for example, during the West Capella incident, we saw a littoral combat ship from the U.S. sail very close to the, the scene of the uh, the dust up, so to speak. Um, but it's not abundantly clear that really had any sort of effect on Chinese decision making in that circumstance. They kind of kept up the pressure campaign on Malaysia. And I think it ultimately resolved with the Malaysian oil rig leaving, I think maybe a week or so earlier than it meant to. Um, so it's not really clear that it had, that had any real effect because China does not necessarily think the U.S. Navy is going to intervene in that circumstance. But if you have a Coast Guard presence, if you have more robust Southeast Asian Coast Guards, if you have more robust U.S. support to those Coast Guards in the terms of maritime security equipment, or if you have shipwriter agreements, or if you even have U.S. Coast Guard vessels in the South China Sea or around Southeast Asia, that is a massive deterrent to Chinese activity because they might be willing to um, be a little provocative around U.S. Navy ships because they know nothing's going to happen. But they don't quite know, or at least they don't really have a playbook for responding to the U.S. Coast Guard or actual civilian maritime enforcement entities like that, because that plays into fears about escalation and all sorts of things. So those are two things that I would probably harp on. All right. Thank you. To the rest of our panel, uh, does anyone else have some thoughts they'd like on either of those questions? Right. Uh, if I could jump in. Uh, one, I did mention that uh, late in the Trump administration, the tri-service the strategy document between the Marine, the Navy, and the Coast Guard came out. So much of what Drake is suggesting, I think, if it's endorsed by the current administration and followed through, uh, would, would assist. But I'd go further. What, what I would, uh, how, do you, how do you make China react to us? Greg wants to revive a, a more abundant alliance with the U.S. The Philippine Alliance Mutual Defense Treaty reads word for word exactly the same as Australia. So it's a two-part street in the Philippines has got to really improve its capabilities. But leaving that there, one is to conduct uh, exercises and operations where you intermix forces that American naval personnel are on Philippine ships and Philippine are on American ships and aircraft. So that China, in facing 
not just I mean, you know a U.S. Coast Guard presence could include uh, law enforcement officials from the Philippines. Then for China, in its mind, if it wants to take any aggressive action, then it has to worry that there's an American presence or there's an American ally where the United States will respond if armed force is used against the armed forces of the Philippines in its ships uh, in the uh, Pacific, including the South China Sea. So it's that. The other one is when, when, when in the past, in the past administration, when we say we stand by you, uh, against Chinese bullying, uh, a far, uh, something that would take a long time to cook up would be for Malaysia or the Philippines or Vietnam to work out diplomatically when they're going to resume or start uh, certain activities that China is likely to react to and invite a U.S. and, uh, you know, uh, Australian, Japan presence in that particular area. One would have to work out the SOPs very carefully, but in other words, um, the U.S. could conduct uh, naval passage exercises in an area to sort of block a Chinese presence, uh, uh, pre be preemptive to do it ahead of time. And then the Vietnamese could conduct oil exploration activities behind that screen. It's to me, it's a more aggressive. And that's what I think is in the tri-service uh, document itself. It's, it's the posture and then, and then leave it to China to be the first to throw a stone to throw a punch or having to back down. And if it rams a ship, that has mixed officers on it, then the consequences are much greater. That's just uh, one of my off-the-cuff ideas that I've been floating for the last several years. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, to the rest of the panel, any additional thoughts on either of those two questions? Can I uh, interject? Sure. Go ahead. Can you just identify yourself to the rest of the audience? Sure. Peter Bartram. I had three ideas that address those three areas, the subsea, the sea surface, and airspace. In the subspecies area, I, the idea was to create a uh, ACN 10 dash line that would be used for a um, subsea power grid that would be a hybrid uh, based on a solar and hydrogen power grid that would connect all the ACN countries through the South China Sea. You could build a narrative uh, against the nine dash line uh, that would be based on the $20 billion investment from Australia that's going to the Singapore, the Sun Cable uh, power grid that's coming up from Australia from the solar farms that are being built there. And that would allow you to then build other solar panels and build a, a, a power grid throughout the South China Sea at the subsea level. And then you would then say, oh, I have to defend that. So then you move to the sea level and then that the way you do that, which is to, uh, to, to add on to the other gentleman's uh, uh, observation about creating a Coast Guard, a unified Coast Guard, you'd have a unified ACN Coast Guard that would be made up of the ACN countries plus quad. And then they would then be patrolling and making sure that when the cable is laid, which is going to be inside that nine dash line of China's designation, then suddenly you've got a, um, uh, a, a alternative narrative that will counter that China is now off off balance. And then finally, on the third, which is the airspace, Philippine was just, uh, Philippine, they just had a, um, just kicked out China on a $10 billion investment for an airport uh, that, that um, and so if the, if the airspace can be controlled from a 12 or $15, $15 billion airspace in the Philippines uh, that is partial commercial and partial military with the quad and ACN uh, jets flying in and out of there, they can then control that airspace over that. Sea. So there's three, basically I'm, what I'm doing is I'm suggesting three alternatives, three narratives, three ideas that can be, uh, that I would like to get the feedback from the, from the group if they think they have any validity. And then the last was that the Darwin of, uh, Navy base uh, and the ACN, um, the Asian NATO, uh, you know, I could, talk about that a little bit, but I don't, I, I just want to say those three ideas, uh, you know, see if, if that has any validity by any of the panelists or get any feedback on that. There gotcha. Go. All right. Sorry. Um, I mean, let, let me, it's, it's a lot of big picture stuff there, but let me touch on a, a few of it. So one, uh, there is no such thing as, as an Asian NATO and can't be, right? I mean, ASEAN uh, is not of one mind on any issue in the South China Sea, least of all. So there, there is no issue on which you are going to, in the South China Sea, which you're going to get ASEAN consensus. The only successful South Asian strategy to confront the South uh, China Sea is going to have to happen 
outside of or in addition to whatever the ASEAN uh, process is. As Carl pointed out, they've been trying for over a quarter uh, century now to negotiate a code of conduct with China and are still arguing the exact same points that they were in the first draft in, in the late 1990s. Um, the When it comes to, to trying to kind of establish any kind of dominance now within either sea space or, or the airspace in the South China Sea, those days are long behind us. China controls the sea space and the airspace of the South China Sea. The math is brutal for the United States. Uh, there is no way that you can compete with a uh, sheer number of hulls. There is no way that you can reestablish air dominance over the South China Sea at a reasonable cost. There is no way that you can countervail China's missile dominance with U.S. Navy and air assets. The only realm in which we are still dominant is subsea. And in any future conflict with China, you're not going to waste your submarines in the South China Sea because they're needed in defense of Taiwan or, or Japan. So the only way to flip this math is to bring geography to bear on, on your behalf. It's, it's what the, the Marine Corps and, and the Army Pacific want to do. It's what uh, Admiral Davidson's made quite clear should be a big part of our focus. Using dispersed, relatively cost-efficient ground-based fire teams in support of mostly air assets to range Chinese surface vessels because one of our missiles costs a lot less money than one of China's destroyers. It's the same thing that the Japanese are doing in the East China Sea and having the Japan Ground Self-Defense Forces invest in missile capabilities in the Ryukyus in order to range the Senkakus. At best, that then gives you a standoff capability, which is really what you want, because what you need is to deter aggression against the Filipinos. And I like Carl's point that in some way or another, you have to have an American tripwire in place in the Philippines in the same way you do in Japan. China has to know that it cannot create division within the MDT that it cannot attack Filipino forces without the risk of killing Americans too, and therefore activating the MDT. Well, yeah, so I think those questions, you know, I, I mean, uh, so far our speaker has emphasized a lot on, you know, what the, the U.S. and maybe Japan and Australia and India can do. Uh, but I think that, you know, for other countries in the society, they need to be proactive too. You know, like, for example, Vietnam is trying very hard to reduce its economic dependence on China by, you know, negotiating several, uh, you know, trade agreements at the same time, you know, including the CPTPP and then the uh, EU Vietnam trade agreement, you know. So um, I think, you know, I think other countries in the South Asia region should follow the example and be more proactive in, um, you know, protecting their interests. Okay. Uh, next one, Andrew Mahler had a question. Andrew, are you able to ask it directly? Sure, I'll ask it. I just uh, China seems to um, be in favor of bilateral rather than multilateral agreements. Is there any way that the other claimants could uh, agree among themselves prior to addressing China? Or you know, obviously in ASEAN, the problem is Cambodia is aligned with China. It, just briefly, a little bit of history. There was an attempt uh, once ASEAN turned to the four claimants and asked them to caucus ahead of time and then report back to ASEAN. And that would have been Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei. And Brunei didn't do it, and the, the whole second meeting never occurred. So that was dead in the water. Uh, it, was, it wasn't delivered. Uh, so th that's the first thing. Two is not all the ASEAN countries have similar interests. And Brunei, for example, did not submit a note to a ballot. It has a, a double statement. So we have to look very carefully. How do you overcome and create that sense of unity? Because China can bring economic pressure uh, on a specific point with any of these countries uh, and to bring them into heel. And, and, and Dick is wonderful. Yes, Vietnam would like to reduce its trade surplus with China, but it's massive. China's the largest uh, trading partner uh, with Vietnam. And, and, and where is, how is that going to happen in practice? So Greg gives us a scenario of China's military dominance, and, and the United States is not number two economic power in the region. It's down the pecking order for many of these countries. So we're limited there. And, and, but the problem is that as I pointed out, when, when the guidelines were being adopted, ASEAN gave away the farm. When they agreed not to caucus ahead of time and only promote dialogue, and then when they agreed to only reach consensus with China on a code of conduct, uh, they put the leadership and the initiative 
in China's hand. Because once you have a Vietnam stop being ASEAN chair and being proactive, and Vietnam generated some very strongly worded statements, particularly on the anniversary, 53rd anniversary of ASEAN, uh, that, that dealt with those relations. You're going back to uh, w w the word I would use is Vietnam is proactive. Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar, as uh, 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 Brunei, as ASEAN chairs, are reactive. And that's not the leadership that we want. So at the moment, we're stuck with those structural impediments and ways of operating. And ASEAN keeps looking at how to revise its charter, bring in qualified majority voting for particular issues. But we're, we're talking, we don't have the decades it would take to achieve that. The issue is much more pressing. All right, thank you. To the rest of the panel, any additional thoughts on that? Car Carl's right. I, I would just add that one of the frustrating things about the South China Sea is that ASEAN is often of two minds. You have several parties, Cambodia, uh, most especially, but also Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, who really don't want to deal with the issue and have very little interest in irritating China in defense of other ASEAN members. Then you have parties like Singapore, which insist that moving South China Sea discussions outside of ASEAN somehow weakens ASEAN centrality. And so you get stuck if you're a Vietnam or a Philippines, in which you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You get uh, hamstrung by going to the organization. And then you get berated by your fellow members if you dare to say that ASEAN is not capable of doing this, which is exactly what happened to the Philippines when they filed their arbitration case. And it's what will happen if Vietnam files an arbitration case. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll, we'll do one more question, I think, before we turn it back to um, Dr. Wilhelm to close for any closing comments. So Gregory Donahue threw a question in there. I'll go ahead and ask it. So his question was um, kind of... Uh, Taking us back to, you know, uh, MCU focus and Marine Corps focus is for the American Marine Corps warfighter who is deployed or is about to be deployed into this region, into the South China Sea, um, looking with the Commandant's new initiative for fire teams interspersed along the nine dash line, which you, you all sort of touched on. Um, are the Marines in, are we, are we adequately from preparing for China's strategy? Using that as a counter, is that an adequate counter, uh, sufficient, or um, what else from a sort of Marine Corps perspective would you layer on top of that? Mr. Long, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is actually going to be one of the things where I, I know a lot about the Marines in China, but I'm not 100% on the up and up about what the fire teams on the nine dash line entails. Is there a little bit more detail about what the commandant said about that uh, that I can get before I answer anything? Uh, I, I think he's referring to sort of the EABO, Expeditionary Advanced Based Operations construct. I, 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 I'm not saying there's a specific thing with fire teams specifically, but that's sort of the overarching structure that the Commandant's been talking about. And it's it's that perspective of sort of forward deployed persistence, um, dispersed uh, to be able to sort of create a complex problem for any Chinese look at aggression and out there, um, and that's also driving certain force design decisions in the Marine Corps to cut certain uh, or reduce certain superfluous or sort of heavier things that can't be moved or shipped around quickly and get some more sort of more nimble, more agile, um, lighter units um, that are also that are one defending the EABs and also uh, looking to, to uh, help position them for some long range precision fires in support of a naval campaign in that overall region um yeah okay i think yeah that does ring a bell um so i would say that when we talk about aabo that we talk about lightly dispersed forces and things like that china is preparing for basically what i would probably describe as a, a pretty clear counter to that and that's simply china is probably the only country in the south china sea that has a very comprehensive isr picture of everything that goes on in the south china sea um, in terms of communicating between its uh, PLA Marine Corps units with ships, with the Air Force, um, with maritime militia, with the Coast Guard, China has probably the most comprehensive picture of what goes on in that area out of any of the claimants, um, maybe second to the U.S., depending on what you look at. On top of that, China has a lot of redundancies baked into its communications infrastructure down there. That would make it very difficult for us to, say, cut off fiery cross reef units from uh, Paracel Island units or cut off Paracel Island units from mainland units, stuff like that. 
where I'm going with this is that in the circumstance where the Marines are in the South China Sea, we're probably going to see a much more dispersed uh, command and control network for the U.S., something that might be a little bit more vulnerable uh, and something that might be reliant on what I would call like less redundancies in that sort of world. And China is preparing for that. That's kind of the, the crux of their strategy is they assume that they will have a common operating picture and they will have enough redundancies that they can execute anything that they need with their joint forces. And at the same time, the U.S. forces will be overstretched to the point where they can take out a satellite or they can run some cyber operations from the PLA Strategic Support Force and basically blind the U.S. Um, so I think where things are going with the commandant's planning guidance and where something is interesting is, you know, getting past the idea that the U.S. is going to be blinded, uh, Marines or the Navy working in the South China Sea may not really be able to communicate or see things as they need to. Um, and figuring out a way to work in that sort of circumstance is probably going to be necessary going forward, or at least that's what China's sort of counting on. For China's Marines, China's Marines really don't have a, a whole heck of a lot in common with our Marine Corps. The PLA Marine Corps service is primarily drawn from army units that were previously tasked with invading Taiwan. That's maybe like three fourths of the PLA Marine Corps. Um, and they are much more of like a, a bit player um, compared to our own service. So they have a bit of a different thing. It's not necessarily a Marine on Marine thing. It's more of a Navy service versus, oh, sorry. It's more of a naval service versus naval service thing, a joint naval service versus a joint naval service thing. So that's that's really how China's approaching it. And uh, that's kind of how the Marines, I think, are heading that way too, or our Marines are, or the U.S. Marines are. So I think that China has anticipated this sort of strategy. Um, I don't think it really changes fundamentally what they're planning, the new guidance or EABO concepts. I think that China's still going to stick to the idea that they can have a common operating picture, they can dominate ISR, they can herd massive amounts of forces to see when they want to. And at the same time, they can kind of blind the U.S. and uh, take advantage of a sort of overstretched kind of force. And that was a lot, but that's, that's sort of uh, how I would answer that, if you want to take my opinion on it. So I, I'm a lot more... Um optimistic than than drake is i the the goal of the united states is twofold when it comes to the first island chain one is to strengthen deterrence uh within the first island chain china has since the early 1980s clearly established a goal of make of excluding the united states and any other aggressor from operating within the south and east china seas and the yellow sea and they are dangerously close to being able to do that. And the only way that you can change that math is by establishing a joint force that includes ground-based fires within both Japan and the Philippines, because the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force cannot possibly win this foot race, and who can build the most boats vis-a-vis the PLAN? We, we've already lost. Nothing is going to change that trajectory. It doesn't mean that you need to be able to effectively disable the airstrip at Mischief Reef from Palawan, because you can't. I mean, we've done analyses of this. A lot of other people have. The amount of ordnance you would have to walk up and down these islands is just prohibitively expensive, and it makes no sense in a warfighting scenario. You need to be able to range Chinese surface ships, which you absolutely can, with a dispersed presence across the Philippines and Japan's southwestern islands. That makes China think twice. It seriously raises the risk of escalation for Beijing, thereby strengthening deterrence, and it allows you to prevent China from treating the South and East China Seas as a sanctuary during any conflict. No, I'm going to just reiterate. I believe that some of the the key issues uh, and even uh, Greg's uh, pessimism are addressed in that tri-service strategy. In other words, the U.S. is aware of, of the strategic position that China holds and has got what appears to be a, a well thought out a strategy. So we've got the Biden administration has got 150 days to come up with a national security strategy. And let's just see what the continuity is. Uh, I don't think it's a lay down game. Uh, that offense defense uh, is not static. And besides which, the South China Sea, as we started off with the semi-enclosed, China can put all its ships that it wants in there. 
and I think what Greg was suggesting, they become then targets. And so it's not just uh, China gets overwhelmingly dominant. And then we can expand that out to a larger uh, issue. And we talk about uh, this alliance for democracy, uh, but also to, 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 you know, we may have to go back to a, a kind of containment strategy globally. And I'll just end that Australia is now a huge victim of China's tariffs, sanctions, cutting of billions of dollars off. And our discussion earlier was how to help the countries of Southeast Asia. Well, how the hell does Australia help someone when it's now one of the greatest victims? And I think that studies have shown that some 51 instances of China using that economic power on Norway and other countries from time to time has been there. So what's needed is really global leadership, and not just treat, as we were treating the China Sea in isolation, needs to be linked to Taiwan and the East China Sea, as well as China globally. And so uh, I think there are kind of pressures that can be brought on and developments technologically uh, that can challenge the Chinese dominance, or in other words, uh, make it the deterrence is it's not worth the game for China to step up something when there can be pushback, leaving China either to back down or to escalate. All right. Thank you. And then uh, just general comment for the audience. I think the, the tri-service maritime strategy has been mentioned a number of times. We'll make sure we throw that as a reference into the show notes and we hang the recording for this so everybody can follow along with what they're talking about. Great. Well, I think that, uh, that takes us through most of the questions and looking at the time, I'll just uh, turn it back to Dr. Wilhelm for any closing comments and thoughts. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, just really wanted to thank all of our speakers. A you know, phenomenal opportunity to hear all of you and the interplay between you, uh, I think, was, was everything I could have hoped and more. Uh, thank you to uh, everyone who attended today. Um, you know, certainly your, your questions, uh, you know, en enhance all of the conversation. Uh, encourage, uh, you know, everyone at, at MCU and, and beyond to, to continue to think about this problem holistically and, and with a grand strategy approach, because I, I think it's, you know, certainly China has not limited themselves to simply a militaristic um, solution to this problem, and, and we not need not look at that either. And so I, I think, that, you know, we... We have a tendency to focus on the, the tactical because it's what what we we sort of have our, our as our purview. But I, I would uh, always keep the strategic in mind because uh, you know it's, it's only then that we've we've you know come come back around to good places. So thank you all for your participation and uh, good evening and uh, and have a wonderful weekend. All right, thank you, Dr. Wilhelm, and I'll I'll just extend a final thanks to the the entire panel. Um, Dr. Wilhelm had a, was a huge part of being able to put this thing together at the Crew Life Center. We are, we realize we're, we're the beneficiaries of a lot of good work, um, of other people to make this happen. So, uh, thank you all for your time today. Um, I'm kind of itching. I'm excited to get this one posted up on our YouTube channel and our Spotify account so we can share this again with everybody who I uh, wasn't able to attend live. And I, that last comment there from Dr. Wilhelm on sort of the larger strategic perspective, what was, sort of bouncing through my mind in a lot of this is that there we got the tri-service maritime strategy, but also the MCDP 1TAC 4 and the Marine Corps on competing was released recently. And that looks at that broader dime perspective. And I think all the comments here um, are very much grist for the mill to help us think through that new strategic doctrinal concept and help employ it. So again, thank you to all. Thank you to the audience for coming in today. And we, on the broadcast, we will be off next week. However, we will be back in two weeks on February the 18th for our next episode, and we'll be advertising our guests and topic here in the days to come. So we'll hope to see you all then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.